Yes, yeah, we're ready. Okay, good evening, everyone. Hello. Yes, my mic. I'm Sarah Klein. I'm the programming manager here at Shard Center. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the programming manager here at Shari Tzedek, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome our speaker tonight, Sanford Mall, who's a dear, dear friend of mine and my first employer back in 2008. <laughs> Sanford is the founder and senior partner of Mall Malisone Cooney, the holistic elder care and special needs and estate planning law firm in Farmington Hills. And he will be talking about why estate plans don't work. Shocker. I'm very curious to see why. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sanford Mall. All right, well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Uh, you know, I am an estate planning lawyer. So that probably, you know, helps make that title that make even, you know, a little bit more intriguing. Why would an estate planning lawyer tell you that it's important to know why estate plans don't work, right? Well, obviously, I'm hoping that when I'm done, you'll know why they don't work and hopefully maybe also the kind of things you can do to help ensure that yours will work, right? So uh, first, let's look at um, what, is, what does it mean by working, right? What is an estate plan supposed to do? So I've Got, this is not an exhaustive list, but I've got some ideas on here. What should an estate plan do? Well, while you're alive and well, and you'll see a little bit later, I've got kind of three points in time when we talk about estate plan. When you're alive and well, it should give you full control and remain private. In other words, none of anybody else's business, right? So full control, remaining private, coordinating all of your assets, so that they will be managed the way you want and by whom you want. Now first, that means you while you're alive and well, but you'll see in a minute that may not be you later on. And it should give you peace of mind. So, you know, as you're going through your own mental checklist about your own planning, decide whether or not it does at least that. Next, when you're not so well, so we're alive and well, maybe we'll reach a point where we're not so well. When you're not so well, Disabled, not meaning you got a broken leg, but meaning maybe you can't handle things and manage things for yourself. It should keep you and your family out of court, right? How many people would prefer to have the judge decide what happens to you? <laughs> right? Nobody? I get that. Exactly. So we want to keep everybody out of court, and a good estate plan, one that works, will do that. Uh, you want to empower those that you trust to manage things for you when the time comes when you need that help. Not somebody else that somebody decides, like a judge deciding, oh, well, I think I'll appoint that person because they gave me a nice campaign donation and that's why I'm now wearing this robe and I got this gavel, right? We want to empower the folks that you would trust to make medical decisions for you when you are no longer able to make them for yourself. As long as you can make them for yourself, you're in charge. But when you can't, if you don't have somebody to do this, and this is really important, because I still have lots and lots of people come to me and say, well, you know, my family will be there, my family will do that for me, but in Michigan, we don't have family consent. And what that means is family can't do that for you, right? And I know a lot of people are going to have stories to tell me, yeah, but when so-and-so was in the hospital, I was in that. This is what happened. That's true. As long as everybody's agreeing, and especially if you're lucid and you can speak for your own mind, no problem. And if everybody's agreeing and it's consistent with medical practice, the standard of care, again, not a problem. But if you've got two people standing there, say kids, and they disagree, forget about it. Right? Even if you got spouse and kids standing there and there's a little bit of disagreement, nah, -uh, you're going to court unless you have the proper documentation. Preserve your assets in the event of long-term care. Another huge, huge gap missing in most estate plans that I see. Hey, how are you? Uh, so this is what happens when you're alive and well and not so well, and this is what a plan should do. After death, what should a plan do, right? And sometimes people say, I don't care when I'm gone, who cares? Well, we, the fact is, is that in reality we do care. We, and we care a lot. And some people have very, very good reasons to care even more than others. But after death, it should protect 
your loved ones, your beneficiaries, whoever it is that you've left something for. You want to leave your legacy intact and you want to keep them out of probate court. You, again, you want to keep the estate out of court. Have your chosen persons privately manage your estate and make sure that they're doing that in the best interests of your beneficiary. Uh, it, it sounds obvious and logical, but if you have certain ideas in your mind about how you want things to happen, but it's not written down or it's not legally enforceable, there's no guarantee that's what's going to happen. Again, another example why plans, many plans, do not work. And you want to distribute what you've left behind to the persons that you want in the way that you want. And I say that because, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, when I'm gone, my, you know, my beneficiaries will get it, and whatever they do with it, they'll do with it. And then there's lots of people who say, well, wait a second, that's not really the best idea. Maybe we want to leave money to people that can't manage money as well. Maybe there's people with special needs. Maybe there's drug problems, creditor problems, marital problems, any number of issues that might be existent in their life. Maybe we want to leave things for our grandchildren who are maybe a little too young to manage things. So you have to have proper planning in place to make sure things work. And who wants to do that? Save taxes. Right? And show of hands. How many people would prefer to save some taxes? Right. And a good estate plan should allow for that. And also, how about professional fees? Right? Maybe counterproductive for me, but good for you. Right? be a good idea that a plan that works, this is what it should do. So let's go back and review, right? Take all these off the board for a minute, go back here. This is what should happen while you're alive and well. This is while you're alive, either well or disabled. And this is after death. These are the things that we want to have happen. Now, a very, very well-designed plan may do that, but we're going to learn more here. What do we want to avoid? We want to, anybody want to agree with this? Want to avoid running out of money? Good idea. All right. We don't, don't want to burden children or others, right? Well, I, I, I should say that's not true. For me, there's my daughter in the back, and I've already <laughs> told her my estate plan is she's taking care of me. So that's it. We, want to, we don't want to leave our house unprotected. We don't want to lose the homestead. We don't want to put ourselves or our family at risk, right? So being unprepared can cause significant financial and emotional harm. And, and, and this is important because it's not just all about money, is it? Right? We're going to talk about that a little bit more, about the kind of things that happen and the kind of emotional things that go on. And the fact that we don't want to see that happen for ourselves or our loved one. And the, and the stresses that, that, uh, that people go through, especially caregiver spouses, you know that the statistics are astounding? How many cares, caregiver spouses do worse than the spouse they're caring for? It's astounding but true because the amount of stress is so huge. So here's a really basic guideline. I teach estate planning lawyers estate planning. And I, you know, with lawyers, you got to teach them right at a really basic level. Okay? Like, you know, A comes before B, and then after that, what's next? Right? And half the time they get that wrong. But, so you've got to teach lawyers. I've got a couple lawyers in the room, so they know what I'm talking about. We've got to teach lawyers, maybe more than a couple. Um, we've got to teach lawyers slowly. So this is how I do it. So this is about estate planning. It starts out, here's our timeline, alive and well, alive and not so well, and not so alive. All right, we're all on, on board with that. And then we have legal tools that go along with it. One's called the will. This is the one that most people think about when they think about estate planning. The will, just so we're clear, when does it go into effect? When you die. Right, exactly. It has no impact and no effect while you're alive. A lot of times people think, well, that's all I need is a will. Well, maybe if that's all you care about is a letter to a probate judge and you hope the judge is going to agree with you. Now, that's not the best estate plan, at least in my opinion. Um, because a will always requires probate. Right? Most, a lot of times people think that you've got a will, you're all set, everything's done, you don't have to worry about anything else. No, a will has no legal authority. The personal representative, the person who's supposed to execute and carry out your wishes has no legal authority to do that unless they've got an, a, an order from the probate court. Yeah, so it's a probate process. The other side of the spectrum, when you're alive and well, 
And it's a legal document that straddles both lifetime and after death is a trust. And for this purpose, and you know there's probably thousands of different variations of trusts, right? So just for this purpose, a basic estate planning trust is a revocable, meaning you can change it. Living, meaning that's when you set it up while you're alive. The fancy, the fancy uh, Latin term is inter vivos, meaning during lifetime. A, a revocable living trust. And that trust does everything that a will can do, but it can do it all without probate. Right? So that's a better legal planning tool, right? without probate. The trust, when you set it up, however, is nothing more than an empty bucket. It's a hope and a promise, but you gotta do something for it to work. And I'll talk about that in a minute. In between the goalposts, we've got these medical and financial powers of attorney. Probably the most important legal planning documents you can have during your lifetime. The single most important one, in my opinion, is the medical power of attorney. And I sit on the ethics board for Beaumont Health, and I've been on that board now for about six years. I teach law and bioethics at the medical school. That's in addition to being my, my law practice. And I can tell you how many times this issue comes up where we don't have properly empowered surrogate decision makers. I'm sorry, am I in yeah, I'll, I'll move. Uh, properly empowered surrogate decision makers to be able to carry out your wishes, the wishes of the patient, and instead what happens is probate court, guardianship, judges making decisions, guardian and litem making decisions, um, uh, strangers being appointed to make decisions, and generally not the thing that most people want to see happen. Financial power of attorney, also very important, I'll manage uh, things. And by the way, sometimes people ask, well, if I've got a trustee, that's the fancy, the fiduciary is a fancy name for the person that you're going to rely on to carry out your wishes. Your trustee is the fiduciary in the trust. If, you're tr if, you have, if you have a trustee and you have a power of attorney, so you have an agent acting under power of attorney, why do you need both? Well, here's a good, good reason. For example, how many people uh, have retirement plans? Right, 401ks, IRAs, anything like that. Yeah, a lot of people have those. Well, if you have a retirement plan during lifetime, guess what? It's not owned by your trust. It can't be. Well, it could be, but then you'd be paying a lot of taxes. So it's not a smart idea. So that is not owned by your trust. If something happens to you and somebody needs to have the legal authority to get into and access your retirement plan, your trustee has no power to do it, but your agent under power of attorney can if the document is properly drafted. And I say that because I review lots and lots of these. I've done thousands of them, and I've probably reviewed uh, just about as many. And I can tell you that a, a, a basic standard, certainly the form documents you pull off the internet, or, will not have the scope of authorities that you need in order to help ensure that all of your assets can be properly managed. All right, so let's go back here for a minute. I don't, I don't have the graphic on here, but uh, for those people who have trusts, you're gonna find out when I get into the next slide of the seven most common, and that's why you've got your worksheet there to take some notes, seven most common mistakes. If you don't have all your assets lined up with your trust, you're, it isn't gonna work. What, you know, estate plans don't work. Well, there's a good reason. If it's not lined up with the trust, it's not going to work. All right, let's, let's look at this. Most common first reason is kind of obvious. If you don't have a plan, well, guess what? It's sort of like Yogi Berra said, right? Any road will get you there. We don't know where we're going, right? And that's what will happen. Well, the state has a plan for you, but the likelihood is, is you're not going to like that plan is not going to carry out the wishes the way you want. Who's going to be in charge? I don't know. Maybe a judge is going to decide, right? What's going to happen with your loved ones? I don't know, right? There is a, 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 um, a hierarchy of what happens to the assets when somebody dies intestate, fancy word for meaning without a will, without an estate plan. But for most people, when I talk to them and tell them, and we're not going to do it here, tell them what that default rule, what the default plan is, most people say, that's not what I want. So not having a plan, that's a mistake. Having a plan, but it's out of date. 
This is probably more, even more common in my experience for people who come to see me. It's more common people have planning. Every now and then I get people walk in, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I thought it was really cute when I had a 90-something-year-old walked in and said, you know, I, I think it's time that I uh, think about doing some estate planning. Yeah, I think so. Hey, but to her credit, she was still, uh, you know, driving and coming into the office. Anyhow, an out-of-date plan, very common problem, and it could be out-of-date for any number of reasons. Because life happens. Things change. Laws change. Your financial circumstances change. The people you're going to rely on to help you out may not be there. Other things have happened. Other change. If your plan is out of date, it's likely not going to work. Not funding the plan. That's coordinating all of your assets together with making sure that then they're going to flow through the plan that you've designed so you don't have something... Oh, I mean, Look, I had a case not that long ago where a, a person dies and uh, the ex-wife got all the insurance, right? The current wife was, of course, a little more than upset, right? <laughs> oh, gee, forgot to change the beneficiary designation. <laughs> so, right? A simple thing to do, but if you don't fund the plan, if you don't make sure everything is coordinated, you're going to end up with a result that's not desirable. Having an out-of-date beneficiary designations. Well, there's the example I just gave you, right? Funding the plan means making sure your title to your assets is right. So here's a classic one, right? You buy a piece of property, call it a vacation, I don't know, a, co a cottage. Buy the cottage, so two friends get together and do that, and they own the cottage jointly. And they each go <coughs> home and they tell their families, we got this cottage, don't worry, something happens to me, you're going to have the cottage, it's going to be there for you. And they even go and they go to a lawyer and they write in their estate plan, when I die, my cottage goes to my family, right? First person dies, who owns the cottage? The other guy. Not the family. It doesn't matter what the plan said. Because title controls it. Title controls it. If your assets aren't lined up, things aren't going to happen the way you want. Joint ownership. Right? I just, again, gave you a little bit of an example. But I'll give you another classic example of why... Joint ownership is a mistake. I had a case uh, a few years back where mom decided after dad passed away, the smart thing to do was to put her number one son on the home with her because he was you know, brilliant, because he had lots of money, because he was very successful, and because, of course, he was going to make sure that the other two kids were going to get their share, right? All right, we got the laughter on the last part, but here's what happened. He ended up going bankrupt. Yeah, this is a true story. And he also had a big tax lien against him. Yeah, guess what? Those creditors are coming after mom's house because he was a co-owner. Yeah, and that's a true story. So joint ownership is often a real big mistake. All right, not protecting beneficiaries from creditors and predators, including the spouse. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, think about the plan of, all right, the kids are just going to get it. We'll let them figure out what they're going to do with it. We're not going to control from the grave, right? But you know or you're concerned that there may be some problems. I mean, you already know this. And you say, well, I'm not going to worry about it. Well, if you're not going to protect them against the things that could happen, then what's going to happen to the, to the legacy you've left behind? Right? Half of it could be lost in divorce. All of it could be lost to a creditor or tax issues. I mean, I had a case also where, where mom comes in in tears. And she didn't have a lot of money. She had three kids. One of them was an alcoholic. The other one was a drug addict. And the other one was a spendthrift. Right? And she says, what am I going to do? And I said, well, you tell me. What do you want? Right? That's always what I start with. <laughs> you tell me. What do you want? Right? I love the one that comes in and says to me, here's what I want. I want to leave a million dollars to each of my kids. I said, great. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we got to start with that. How many kids you got? Three. Good. How much money you got? Well, I got about 500000 I said, well, we got a problem. Right? I, mean, I, can't do, I can't work miracles. I can't do some things. I can't work miracles. Anyway, so we've got to make sure that we really put 
the, you know, on the table, what, what's going on, what do you want to accomplish, and then there are very, very good legal tools and strategies to be able to do that. But, just like I said before, if the plan's out of date because things have changed now, the plan's not going to work. And of course, not having the long-term care protection, notice that I brought that up twice already, and I'll tell you why. You know, we, have, we have basically three horsemen of the apocalypse in estate planning. Right? What are they? Probate. Everybody agree? That's one we want to avoid. Right? We don't want that in our lives. We want to avoid probate. Frankly, I like probate. Guess why? Why? I make money there. Right? Right? You don't want probate because it's not a good thing for you. But for me, I love. Hey, judge, how are you? Yeah. Nice to see you. Right? But most people don't want to have probate. So that's the first first one. What's the second one that everybody knows about? Everybody knows about this one. Taxes. taxes. Right. Everybody wants to avoid taxes. The third one that nobody seems to really talk about a lot, and that's why I keep putting it up there. I've already given it away. Long-term care. If you want to know what the biggest risk that any of us have to decimating the wealth that we have, you know, meticulously tried to keep together so we can afford to live, it's the cost of long-term care. Anybody have an idea what the cost of long-term care is for a nursing home in the state of Michigan average? This is done by the state of Michigan. Department of Health and Human Services puts these numbers out annually. What do you think the average annual cost of a nursing home is? 70 to 80,000. No, it's okay. more like 100 to 125. You, Barbara, how are you so smart? <laughs> you know there. how I'm so smart. <laughs> You've been there. By the way, she designed my office. Uh, yeah. So, you know, in fact, it, Barbara is right. It is today, especially in Oakland County, we're talking ten to fifteen thousand dollars a month. But statewide, it's a hundred thousand a year, and that's every nursing home in the state, average together. That's the state average. So there are some that are less. Hundred thousand a year. Hundred thousand a year. It pays to die. It pays to die. Oh, by the way, if you think you're going to stay home for less, wrong. I've got people living at home, thirty thousand dollars a month. Fortunately, they got the money. But they, you know, I've got one case right now. Started out with five million dollars, and the kids said, "Oh, there's not going to be any problem. Mom and Dad will be all set." Yeah. So now here we are, three and a half years down the road. And they're starting to think about what do we have to do to try to protect some money. Started out with five million. I know it's a scary thought, but that's why we dig our head in the sand because we, you know, it's so scary we don't want to think about it. But you can not think about it and do nothing and be completely vulnerable, or at least you can do what you can do and have some protection, whatever that may be. And it's not just all long-term care insurance. But for some that are young enough and healthy enough and can budget for it, it's a great option. You're buying a bucket of money to help you. And there are really good types of, of policies you can buy now that also have death benefit and everything else. But I don't sell them and I don't make any money selling them. I, if anybody wants anything questions about them, I know enough about them and I know what are, what, which ones are good and not, but that's a different story. All right, so these are the seven most common estate planning mistakes. And the reason I bring this into the talk of why estate plans don't work. This is the reason, these are the reasons. Now, it's not the exhaustive list, but this is the, you know, the tip of the iceberg. These are the reasons. People don't have a plan, or they got an out-of-date plan, or they haven't really looked, and they haven't taken the time to make sure that the things are, everything's coordinated properly. They haven't doubled back to make sure, you know, how many, how many of you have life insurance policies or annuities? with a company today that wasn't the company that you bought it from. <laughs> Lots of it, right? Yeah. That's very common, because all these mergers are everything else. Guess what we have found out? What, you know, all that paper shuffling? Oh, today everything is digital, right? Everything's on the computer. Was it 20 years ago? No. Right? So when we find out all this shuffling back and forth, often what happens is they lose the beneficiary designations. We've actually had this happen, where what, and if they lose it, they have to assume it goes to your estate. Going to your estate means it goes to probate. Right? Now, even if you have a fancy trust and a will that says everything goes into your trust, it goes into your trust after it goes through probate. Right? 
So in our office, as an example, one of the things we do is we make sure we look at every one of those assets that are beneficiary designation assets and make sure that we have revised, even if they're identical to what you did before, but now we got a new one, it's up to date, we know it's going to be digital, we got a copy, we know that we can make sure it's going to happen the right way. The joint ownership. All right? You, nobody in this room will do this, but you can fess up for other people you know, right? Yeah. You probably know people who have done that as a, as a means for estate planning, right? In probate avoidance. Not a good idea. All right. Let's move on. So this is the number one mistake, right? Planning to fail. All right. If you're not planning, that's Ben Franklin, by the way, for those that don't know. I'm sure it's picking me up. That's okay. Got it. Uh, anyway. If, if, you, if you fail to plan, right, you're planning to fail. So not having a plan is the number one mistake. Four, top four reasons why most do not plan. Fear. They don't want to think about it. Sort of conjuring it. Oh, no. But, you know, superstition. Don't want to talk about it. Don't want to think about it. Confusion. I just don't understand it. No matter what I do, you know, this is all too, under, too, too confusing. Go to the lawyer, you know, talk some mile a minute. I have no idea what he's talking about, right? I, get, I, I, I look at a document, I try to read it. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's written in, in some foreign language. I mean, this is, these are the, the things people tell me. Frustration. I got too many other things to do and I can't handle those. Right? Right? Denial. Those are the top four. Can you think of another one? Yeah, I can. Cost. Right? That's another reason why people delay. So, why? Because you don't know or don't understand the rules. So I, have a, I have a question I ask in, in, in talks like this. Do you think the people in Washington and Lansing follow the same set of rules we do? No. Heck no, I heard. Okay, I saw one of these. Anybody think the answer to that question is, yeah, everybody's got the same rules? Raise your hand. Nobody, okay. So, universally everybody thinks that. Well, in reality, the difference is, is those folks actually have really good advisors. And maybe some of them are themselves. And I've got friends of mine who have done what I do, and, and, and they're sitting in the legislature. So they have some insight about these things. So they, if they know the rules, they can apply the rules to their unique set of facts. And guess what? They get a plan that works. Isn't that a good idea? Get a plan that works. So, for you, if you're not going to go to law school and take the next 25 years and do the thousands of plans that I've done to get to where I am, you might instead want to come talk to somebody that knows the rules that can help make sure that your unique set of facts will actually work. They don't have a trusted advisor who can help. This is a big one. Because how do you know who to trust? I mean, how do you even know? And, and it is a, it's a big one. And i got to tell you, I tell my daughter this, you know, now that she's working in the law firm with me. And I tell her, I say, you know what, unfortunately, 98% of the lawyers out there give the 2% of us a bad name. Yeah, that'll sink in for a minute, right? Yeah. In other words, often the bar, right, is not that high to be a whole lot better than, than the rest. And, and I'm not casting aspersions on my colleagues. I'm just telling you that what I see in practice What happens without a plan? There's the number one. That was one of the first things we wanted to avoid, but there it is. It's, a, it's there. During incapacity, bad idea. Judge is making a decision about who's going to do what and say what and what's going to happen to you. And by the way, did anybody read any of the exposés about what was happening in Oakland County with public administrators managing the lives of people with incapacity? If you haven't, Google it. Anybody know what Google is? <laughs> okay, if you, I'm just checking. Yeah. Uh, if you have it, Google that, right? Use that search term, uh, Oakland County Public Administrator Probate Court. You will be shocked. And don't take my word for it. Read the exposés. Conservatorship protects assets. Guardianship protects the person. Those are two different kinds of probate proceedings. After death, probate court is a decedent's estate, an intestate or testate, meaning with or without a will probate court, unless you've done some other things to avoid it. Now, the Swiss cheese plan is you do joint ownership, you do quick claim deeds, you do all these other things, right? you do beneficiary designation to the kids, you do all this other stuff, and you just hope and pray 
you open pray, a few things are going to happen. One, everybody's going to die in the right order. Two, nobody's going to be disabled and everybody's going to be just fine. Three, there's not going to be any creditor problems, spendthrift problems, marital problems, right? There's not going to be any of that. And as long as none of that happens, then yeah, you're probably right, those other things can work. Right? That's why I call it Swiss cheese planting. There's a few holes. Most people don't want Swiss cheese planting. Number two reason out of date, plans out of date. So if it was properly designed, that's great. But if your current needs are a little different than your prior needs, then maybe it's not up to date. I mean, I'll give you a really good example. You know, right now, and I mentioned that you can actually protect assets for a surviving spouse, and let me tell you what it is. So husband and wife get together uh, to come in and do estate plan. Most of them will end up with, you know, some stack of documents, right? Maybe a trust, maybe two trusts, powers of attorney, wills, and that's it. And what does the plan say? Right? When husband dies, who gets everything? When wife dies, who gets everything? Right? But if wife dies first, who gets everything? Husband, okay? So it's the honey, I love you type planning. So what happens if husband dies and wife's in a nursing home? Who gets everything? Nursing home. Exactly. <laughs> right. Was that the plan? No, it was a terrible plan. So there are ways to do that where husband dies first. Who gets everything? The wife in a special trust set aside for her that's not countable. It's completely exempt, protected against Medicaid eligibility so she can be eligible for extra assistance. And the $100,000 a year is paid for by Medicaid. Now, that doesn't mean a bad nursing home. If you want, I can show you. There are many in this area right here that you probably have visited before. And they're nice homes. And guess what? They, get, they take Medicaid. Don't right? you have Most to people pass a means test? What's that? Don't you have to pass a means test? A means test. Yeah, the good Medicaid? question. That's part of the, that's part of the issue. <coughs> Passing a means test. What this lady is saying is Medicaid is welfare. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. But let's give you a real case. Real case of a husband dies $800,000 in his trust. The $800,000 was put into a special trust for his surviving spouse. She also had about $150,000 on her side. After that $150,000 was spent down to $2,000, that's the means test for her, she got Medicaid. The $800,000 is in a trust for her benefit, but it doesn't count as her asset. Right, so it's possible to do. Now, the, the honey, I love you plan, that's not what happens. Right? So we've got to make sure that if, change, if you have changing needs, maybe it's time to update and change a plan. That's just an example. So an out-of-date plan might include the wrong people having control. How many people have d brushed the dust off the plan that you have and read it through and make sure you know what it says recently. Yay! <laughs> you get the gold star. Okay, good. And was it perfect? No. And it wasn't perfect. Okay. So you get the gold star and you prove my point. Yeah. Okay. And for those who haven't, take that example. Because it happens often. Oh, I thought something. I thought I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. How many people have even read their estate plan? How many people fully understand it? <coughs> Wouldn't it be nice to just understand it at least? And make sure that you could ask like legitimate, real life human questions. Like, hey, if such and such happened and this happened, would, what would happen then? That's, that's what I think you should be able to do by talking with your lawyer about how your plan works and how it's designed and whether or not it really meets your needs. If you can't have that kind of conversation, you got the wrong lawyer. Not that I'm trying to steal anybody's business, but I'm just going to tell you, right? I mean, because part of meeting your needs is being able to have that understanding. I don't want to cast aspersions on the medical profession, but that's, you know, then that would be like having a lawyer like your doctor. They don't tell you either. They just say, oh, this is the next pill you need. This is the next thing you got to do. Here's the next test you got to take. And after that test, you got to take another. I, I, not that I'm down on the medical profession, but remember, I do intersect with it a lot. All right. All right. Out-of-date laws. How often do the laws change? Anybody hear of a new thing called the SECURE Act? 
Anybody, anybody hear that? Yeah, you have? Okay, you have? Right. You know what that? You know what that's about? Yeah. And for those that maybe don't know, that was a law that was passed in December of last year and became effective January 1st of this year. So we had a whole 10 days to try to figure out what the law... We still don't know for sure all the details of the law. But it changed things dramatically about how your beneficiaries can enjoy the use of your of your retirement plan assets really big changes and really really big now for spouses not a difference for kids a big difference for kids that have chronic illness or beneficiaries that have chronic illness or that have special needs a huge difference but these are things that the laws change your plan is probably not consistent with that law because it just it literally just changed What's the name of it again? Secure. Secure. Yeah. Capital S E C U R E, and it stands for something. Uh, but anyway, the point is, laws change all the time. The power, Durable Power of Attorney Act went into effect and got updated in uh, 2012. Uh, the Michigan Trust Code was uh, <coughs> was uh, put put into effect for the first time in 2010. Has been amended many many times since. Most recently. Uh, within the last couple of months, and we got new provisions going into effect still this year. I mean, things are changing. Now, many of those things may not impact your plan directly, but then again, it may. How do you know? You only know if you get your plan reviewed by somebody who knows that, that can help make sure that your plan works. Not funding the plan. As I said, funding is the process of changing title and beneficiary designations. Those are the things that are going to control where your assets go. It's going to control who, who has access, who has authority, and, who, and, where, and who's going to have the enjoyment of those assets after you're gone. Not funding it means it's probably not going to work the right way. Out-of-date beneficiary designations, again, we've already talked about it. That's the number four reason. If you want to make sure the right people are going to get it, I just say the easiest thing to do is let's just do a new beneficiary designation and send it in, keep a copy, and make sure that we have that as our evidence to support what, you, what the wishes are. Joint ownership, as I said, it subjects the asset to co-owners, creditors. It often does not coordinate well with an estate plan. Um, how many times I see uh, you know, well, son's going to get this, and daughter's going to get that, this one's going to get this, and then they're all going to sit down at a nice family meal, and they're all going <laughs> to figure out what they're, and they're all going to, and everybody's going to even up. Really? You, you, I mean, you really think that happens in the real world? Right? It just doesn't. Uh, even just putting one of the kids on as the, as the person, as the co-owner uh, uh, on the bank account, right? So oh, at least that we know they can pay the bills and they don't have to go to probate. Yeah, there are much better ways of doing that. And I'm not worried because my daughter's going to share it with her siblings. Okay, but there's still better ways of doing that, right? I mean, I had one where, uh, where, where another lawyer had said to, the, to, the, uh, to, to his client, elder client, um, just, put, just move everything over and put your daughter. You know, daughter says, I don't think that's a really good idea. Tells the lawyer, I don't think it's a really good idea because right now my husband and I, um, we're having some financial problems in and we're, we're actually, we may actually have to file bankruptcy. And the lawyer says, oh, that's not going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. $300,000 of dad's asset went. Right. They, they hired me to see if I could sue. Right. For uh, I don't do legal malpractice cases, but that, that was what they wanted to come after. Uh, and the answer was no. I, I didn't, but I referred them to somebody else. Uh, and here's the other thing. Uh, inadvertent taxes. So let me give you an example. So. Let's just say we use the old quick claim in the drawer so that the house, you know, so honey, when I'm gone, take this quick claim, go down to the courthouse, right, get this file, and now you'll own the house and you avoid your probate. Okay, you forgot something called taxes. Right? Taxes are important. So you bought the house at whatever level you bought it. Now it's worth whatever it's worth. Now, if you sold it because it's your homestead, you probably have an exemption. You're not going to have to pay a capital gain. For what reason? Because you've lived there in so many years, right? And, and it's your house. 
But if the child hasn't also lived there and it's not their homestead, and now they turn around and sell it after you're gone, their basis, meaning the tax level that it starts out at, what, they, what they're going to be taxed on, based on, is what you paid for. Because it was a gift during your lifetime. Because it was a quit claim deed, even though it wasn't recorded until after you're gone, it was a quit claim deed, and it's effective the day it's signed, not the day it's recorded. And so you go back to say, okay, you paid 100000 the house is now worth 300000 you got a $200,000 gain, cough up the capital gain tax. Right? That's a really bad plan, right? Unexpected, unintentional <coughs> taxes. And they're easy to avoid. The property tax issue is another one, right? The, the child wasn't also residing in the house, it's not their homestead. But you reside in the house, so you're taking the homestead exemption. You're getting a special property tax level that's lower than somebody that owns a house and it's not their homestead. So now you've got a quick claim deed that's 15 years old. In the old days, nobody cared. Now everybody's connected by computer and they got really fancy calculators that do this automatically for them. Go, oh, guess what? 15 years ago you, unpo you un uncapped the property tax and you lost your homestead. Pay up. Interest and penalties too. Yeah. There's all kinds of things that happen with those quick claims in the drawer. <coughs> Not a good plan. Oh, here's another one that happened. Quick claim in the drawer. And then mom says, okay, I, you know, I want to, uh, I'm going to sell the house, or, or I'm going to mortgage the house, whatever it was mom wanted to do. Son says, no, you're not. Well, what do you mean? Of course I am. It's my own. No, you're not. He went and he filed a quick claim. He says, you can't. I'm an owner. I'm not letting you. Yeah. I had that happen, too. No protection against creditors or predators. Well, there you go. You got the list. You know what it is. Bad choices is a big one. Exploitation is another one. That's one where you leave somebody who is potentially vulnerable, and it could be a surviving spouse, it could be kids, who knows. You leave somebody with some money, they're vulnerable to be exploited. Money's gone. Right? And that's a huge problem these days. How many people get these phone calls that I get, and I turn them in, that, hi, I'm from the IRS. This is your final opportunity to pay, right? Yeah. Get those? Yeah? yeah. Uh, scams are everywhere. Exploitation is unfortunately rampant. Not having long-term care protections. Most plans, as I said before, don't have it. Insurance is a great option, but that is not the best option for some people. It's not affordable. The estate plan can help. The estate plan can help fill some of the gaps. Well, one that's designed properly. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the long-term care because it's usually the Achilles heel of many plans. So who pays for care? That's the number one thing to remember. And look at the last bullet there. How many times have I heard people say, well, I'm all set, I've got Medicare. Medicare does not pay for long-term care, right? And I can tell you that not academically anymore. I have Medicare too. It does not pay for long-term care. It does not pay. It pays short-term. You can say, well, but I went to rehab and it paid for the 10 days. Yeah, short-term. Long-term, not Medicare. The number one payer for, for long-term care in, the, in this country, guess what that is? You. No, nope. Medicaid. Medicaid. Number one. Buy it, overwhelming, that's the number one payer. You, your family, long-term care insurance. That's when you're handling it yourself. Medicaid, the number one payer. Veterans benefits, any veterans in the room? Know any veterans? If you know any veterans, there's a, there is also a, a, a special carve-out for under veterans pension that helps pay for things like long-term care, but it only pays an income benefit. And that income benefit is not 100,000 a year. You know, it may be 25, 30,000 a year at most. But it's better than nothing and it's tax-free. Uh, so that's who pays. Long-term care benefits planning options. Long-term care insurance is one of them, as I said. The Spousal Asset Protection Trust, that's the one I said, you know, on the death of the first spouse, what can happen? Gifts to an irrevocable trust. That's another way of helping to protect some assets. I have more and more clients who want to who say to me, I don't need it now, but I got money that I'm probably not going to touch. 
and I don't want it to be money that just goes to a nursing home if I'm, you know, they're demented and have no idea what's going on. I want that money to be protected, right? What can I do? Um, caregiver contracts. This is a big, big, big issue. I, and this one I put under the no good deed goes unpunished rule. Everybody know that rule, right? No good deed goes unpunished. Um, how many of you know people who have paid others for care? Right? Lots of us. And how many times is that not necessarily a caregiving agency? Meaning the nice lady across the street, the same person that took care of aunt whoever, right? <coughs> that, that happens a lot. Or even sometimes, oh, well, my niece will do it. You know, she's not working now. My grandson will do it. Okay. That's all fine and good. But if you don't have a Medicaid compliant caregiver agreement in place, Prior to the transfer of funds, every dollar paid is considered divestment. That's a no-no word. Later on, and I've actually had cases where people have done this. They've spent $200,000 paying for care, day in and day out, staying out of the nursing home, not wanting to get Medicaid, finally run out of money and have no other choice. And they're told, sorry, that $200,000 you paid, you're going to be penalized. You're not going to get Medicaid for two years. Why is that? It, yeah, it's because the state of Michigan, we have a Michigan uh, uh, Court of Appeals case that says that if you've paid a caregiver without a caregiver contract and then you later go back and ask for Medicaid, the state of Michigan is going to impose a penalty on you for doing that. And the caregiver contract has to also be prescribed effectively by a doctor. You have to have all that evidence in place. So if you know anybody who's doing that now, Right? Tell them run, don't walk to somebody like me that can help tell them how to fix where they are. And, I, and we do fix these things. I mean, sometimes we go to court, we get a protective order from the judge that says that the, that the payments that were made previously were all for fair market value. And all of this is legal jargon to tell you this. Fair market value means it can't be divestment. And if a state court judge has given us that order, the Medicaid agency can't say something to the contrary. Right? But, we, but there's things we have to do to fix it. Promissory notes and Medicaid annuities is another thing, that probate court orders, homestead protection. Um, one of the best ways to protect your homestead, anybody ever hear of a ladybird deed? Yeah? Ladybird deed, for those that don't know, is like a beneficiary deed. It says, I own my house, and I continue to own my house, and it's my house, and nobody else can take it from me. However, if I still own the house when I die, I want it to go to my kids or I want it to go to my trust, or I want it to go to the Humane Society. I mean, you can have it go anywhere you want. It's a beneficiary deed, and it's a valid deed. It's a, called a Lady Bird deed, and yes, it's named after Lady Bird Jensen. Um, and that is often one of the best ways. Not universally, don't go home and make up your own Lady Bird deeds. It's not universally the right answer, but in many cases it is. I have a question. Is that the same as a warranty deed? No. A Lady Bird deed can be a warranty deed. Warranty deeds are warranty versus quit claim. A warranty deed says that the person who is making the transfer is warranting what they're transferring. A quit claim deed says, I'm giving you what I own. So I could give you a quit claim deed for the Brooklyn Bridge. I'm just giving you what I own. I have no none of it, <laughs> but you could have a fancy deed that says it, you know. Right? A warranty deed is different, and then I, it, so it's a different thing. But those two things are different, um, and I appreciate your, 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 your question. Can you expand on the uh, irrevocable trust? Sure. Yeah. So under, under Medicaid rules, if you try to, quote, hide the money, right, you can't. Why? Because there's a five-year look back. And if you say, well, how are they going to know? Trust me. They do... <clears throat> very deep dive forensic accounting to find out. They find out. Sometimes it, it takes them a while, and when it does take them a while, it's even worse, because then you've got accumulated penalties, and that's a, that's a, and sometimes even fraud. We have actually had the Office of the Inspector General come after people for fraud, for innocent mistakes. But they said, oh no, they didn't, they didn't disclose it. Yeah, it was, they, they didn't know about it. No, 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 we're coming after them anyway. And then you got to hire a criminal lawyer to defend you, right? So, if you have, if you've made a transfer five years or more prior to 
applying for Medicaid, the money you transfer is exempt. It's no longer counted. Remember what I told you about the husband and wife situation. You don't need five years. That can happen like that. No five-year look back. But if you're trying to say, okay, kids, I got X amount of dollars. I'm going to put this aside. I want to protect it. So no matter what, it's going to be there, right? And I want you to enjoy it. I want the grandkids to enjoy it. What I, I want all that. But, but if I really need it, I'd also like, you know, hey, come, don't forget, right? But you do that, and more than five years after that, you're in long-term care and you need Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid could help keep you in a good nursing home, not a bad nursing home, a good nursing home that you, that, you know, are there good nursing homes? Well, there are some that are better than others, but how many people want to be there? None of us. But it is unfortunately the reality for some of us. We will end up there. Um, if that happens, five years after, that money is protected. It can be used for your benefit if the kids, assuming the kids, you know, still want to help you. Uh, but it's there for your benefit. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, and I would love for you to elaborate on what she did wrong. Um, Not enough time because we go to only till eight o'clock. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but but thank you. A lot of things, right? I mean, first of all, she had a special needs child that there was no proper planning for, right? I mean, there's a really good example of a plan that failed, and she had she had lots of lawyers. I mean, lots of lawyers. Right? And they made lots of money on doing bad planning. Uh, I mean, that's about all I'm going to say. The special needs is the tip of the iceberg, but it's a really, unfortunately, terrible result in a case like that. Um, did I answer your question satisfactorily? Though? No. Okay. So we'll, go ahead, Dan. Irrevocable trust, first of all, you have to put someone in place. Yes. And it doesn't get changed unless that individual, whether it's your daughter or your son or some guy in the yeah. street, yeah. says you can do what you're trying to do. Right. What's, what's the benefit? What, yeah. why, so, why would you even have it? Yeah, so I, let me say this. If, if I were consulting with you and you said that to me, I'd say, do you have anybody you trust? Yeah. Okay, good. Do you trust them enough that they're going to carry out this plan? Yeah. Okay. Well, we got two, two good answers for that, right? So now we put an irrevocable trust together. Now, by the way, in the irrevocable trust, you can retain the right to fire them. You can retain the right to put somebody else in place. You can retain the right to change the beneficiaries. You can retain all those rights in an irrevocable trust. Yeah. The basic question is, what does it do for me? What did, Why have irrevocable the, as opposed to a regular trust? Well, because, because the irrevocable trust starts the five-year look-back clock for in the context of this plan. Now, for your basic estate planning, I agree with you. Revocable trust. No reason to do anything different, in my opinion. Now, if you want to do charitable planning, you want to do insurance planning, you want to do other things, maybe an irrevocable trust is right. Remember, I told you there's thousands of different styles of trust. The basic trust is the revocable one. This one is designed for one specific purpose. And only five year look back. Yeah, five year look back. But you know and what? With a regular trust, there's also the nursing home will do a five year or Medicaid will do a five year look back. No, because anything in your trust counts. Doesn't matter when you put it in. It counts. It all counts. It's all yours. Doesn't matter. You could you could have set it up 25 years ago. It's still your money today. It's still your money. Irrevocable trust starts the clock running. Yes. I think the title of this talk was that you do not need a trust, or did I misread it? You did no. misread it. You misread it. Yeah. The it's, title of this talk was you need a why trust. why uh, estate plans don't work, and I'm giving you all kinds of reasons why they don't work. Meaning I'm also that you telling do you. Need a trust. Well, I'm telling. I don't know if you need a trust. I mean, everybody. No, I don't. I can't say that. Some people trust plan. I, I'm just telling you the truth. I'm a trust lawyer. Okay, it would be easy for me to say, yeah, everybody needs a trust, but that's not true, right? Some people can accomplish their objectives without a trust. I don't know. I never know until I sit down with somebody across the table. I would say, in my experience, most people who come to me, in my experience, most people decide after they understand what a trust will do versus not having a trust, they decide, I want the trust. Okay. I don't sell people on a trust. I educate them on whether or not it's the right thing for them. If they think it is, great, then let's do a trust. Can I hear you 
say that if you have a will, you have to go through probate? If you have only a will, only one. right? Now, not if, if you have a will and a trust, and your will says, when I die, if there's anything that goes to probate, put it in my trust. Yes, there's a probate if there's something that has to go through probate. But if all you have is a will, and you own property, and you're expecting that the, your property is going to go according to the terms of your will, it, it, it likely will go that way. But it has to go through probate court. Right. Okay. Next, what happens when long-term care is needed? And again, we don't have enough time to go through all this. This is that, as I call the seven alarm fire oh, drill, right? All the things that are going on, the stress, the confusion, who knows what's going on, who has documents, who has control, what are the wishes, how do we take care of this, how's it all going to be paid for, right? All that, and if you've ever been through this yourself, you know that this is not a complete list, right? This is the tip of the iceberg of the drama that's being played out. Special needs planning is leaving an inheritance to a person who has special needs. And that's with protection. And as I said, including a spouse, it's possible. And again, most people don't even realize you can do that for a spouse, but you can. Disinheriting somebody with special needs. You know, that was probably the number one way people planned for many, many, many years. You know, I've got three kids, Johnny's got special needs. And because Johnny has special needs, I'm not going to leave anything to him. I'm going to leave it to his siblings because his siblings are going to take care of him. Mm -hmm. Right. That, I, I mean, that was a number one plan. Until, because uh, special needs trust planning has really only come into effect in the 90s. 90s are not that long ago. Well, they are now. But, <laughs> but, but still, for, for some of us, we don't think the 90s were that long ago, right? Yeah, okay. Um, Special needs trusts, the ones that went into effect in the 90s, are first party trusts, meaning if it's the money that belongs to the person with special needs, it's got a payback to the state on their debt. If it's an inheritance trust, no payback. And they got to be done the right way. Anyway, there's my disclaimer. That's saying, don't rely on anything I said. Right? It's not legal advice for you, just general information. And Sarah, I did almost exactly 8 o'clock because I know I saw you stand up. Um, do I have time to take a few more questions? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. My question is, all those rules in Michigan, yeah. what happens if you go to another state? Great question. Yeah. So, um, let's say this. There's a few things that don't travel well across state lines. So your medical power of attorney documents are going to be given um, what I'll call full faith, in, well, all of your documents are going to be given what I'll call full faith and credit. See, under the U.S. Constitution, and believe it, we still have one. And just for those of you as in the room, right, thank you, we don't. We still do have a Constitution. And it does say that among the states, they are required to give full faith and credit to the laws of, it, of another state. And so if you happen to travel to another state and you have, let's say, the medical power of attorney and you end up in a hospital, right, that might not, that wasn't done under that state's law. And we'll assume that state's law is different than Michigan, right? But it will be given some credence as evidence of your wishes. And so it will be at least looked at it through that lens so that hopefully your wishes will be carried out better. Now, if you happen to be like some of my clients and you spend half the year in one place and half the year in another place, well, then have two medical powers of attorney. You have one for Michigan and have one for Florida, you know, where, Florida or Arizona or wherever else it is you go. Right? Or if you just happen to go a lot, right? then have a second one. You know, it's not that big of a deal to have another power of attorney in place, so it'll be respected in that state in case you happen to end up needing medical care there. And the same is true with uh, financial powers of attorney. The, uh, the uh, laws of uh, durable power of attorney are different from state to state, but full faith and credit. Generally speaking, you're going to, you'll certainly be better off with it than without. But if you move, if you literally pick up and move to a different state, then those things should be updated, right? Your, your Michigan documents. Now, trusts travel very well from state to state. Trusts is a slightly different reality. Wills are very state specific. One, one step further. Yeah. If you have property overseas, yeah, well, does it work here? Yeah. Um, then what you need are, you need a lawyer, 
and I do this. Believe me, I've got people who live and travel overseas. And, uh, we need lawyers in the other country. We need to coordinate with the lawyers in the other country. I mean, I've, I've done Israel, I've done Canada, I've done um, uh, 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 England, uh, uh, and, and a few others. I can't remember. Any. But I, I've done, you know, if we've got, especially if we've got assets in another country, also, we need, we need to coordinate the planning with sometimes not only legal advisors in the other country, but tax advisors too. Because the tax laws are different. The treaties are different. We've got to, we've got to line everything up. All right, any other questions? This is a very, very sophisticated question, though. Okay. Um, one of Sarah, the last, is my last things question. you put up to my last question. on the board was the homestead protection. Yeah. Are, were you, am I okay? Okay. You're my the last question. The homestead protection. I don't understand how that works. Um, protection House and Trust is not exempt and beware of ah. a state recovery. Okay, great. Thank you so much for asking the question. You read the slide, but I said it's very good. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've bruised over that because of time. But, okay, everybody knows the rule that your house, if you had to go into nursing care and you needed to get you know help, your house is exempt, right? It's protected. No matter what, the house is protected. Everybody knows that rule? <coughs> okay. How many of you that have a trust or know somebody that has a trust that has a house and the house has been deeded to the trust? Sound at all familiar? Huh? Right? House is in trust? House is no longer protected for Michigan Medicaid purposes. The house is now countable. Why? Because it's a stupid Medicaid rule. Right? I didn't say it makes sense. It's the government. Right? It's just a stupid Medicaid rule. But we can take it out of trust. Once we take it out of trust, now it's it's exempt again, right? That's a, that's it. Mean, why do we do that with a deed? We take it out of trust. But if we do it too late, it means that when you pass away, two things can happen. One, if the state paid anything out for your care, the state is entitled to cash out your house and get paid back. It's called a state recovery. Or two. <coughs> There's, at the very worst, going to be a probate, meaning your house is going to have to pass by probate. The ladybird deed is, as I said earlier, one of the best ways to avoid that. Why? Because it's still yours. You keep all the property tax advantages and, and, tax, and, and, and even capital gain tax advantages. Two, it avoids probate, so we don't have a problem with the probate. Kids get to step up in basis when you're gone. All good stuff. And because it's your house, it's exempt. And because it didn't pass through probate, the state can't touch it and come after it under a state recovery. I know, that's a, that I just said a mouthful. But basically, the bottom line is all the things that could go wrong can be covered by one simple tool. When, when the, that's the right thing. Are you better off putting like a, a, uh, one of your kids in charge of your house. I don't know what that means. Or put it on, put the deed on their name as well as okay. yours. Okay, so you this wrote one. down something really good on the slide, but you weren't listening when I was talking. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to answer her question? The answer is no. Yeah. Right, I'm saying no. His answer is yeah. what he, he what said. What I said no. was no. Unless no. you really, really, really trust your kids. Well, but that's the... <laughs> That's the problem. That's the problem is that we don't know what might happen in their life after after the fact. And as I, I told you the story about this one situation, it's a true story where the mom put her son on as a co-owner of the house because he was successful and he had a good career and he had business and everything else. And he ended up going bankrupt and having a, having a tax lien, and she lost her house as a result. Never. Huh? No. Never, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, anyhow, you've been a great audience. I wish we had more time, but Sarah only gave me an hour. <laughs> usually, usually this talk is four hours long. No, I'm kidding. But it could go. Um, look, the number one recommendation is, if you don't have a plan, get one. If you have a plan, review it. Make sure it's updated. Right? Make sure it's consistent with your current needs. If it's not, it's probably not going to work. Get a trusted advisor if you don't already have one that will sit with you and explain so that when you leave their office, you're not more confused than when you came in. That way you have some really good insight and idea of what it is you have and how it works. How much right? do you charge for an initial okay, session? Okay, we're, we're done. Uh, oh, <laughs> for holding hands. 
How much, I'm sorry, it's for, for doing holding, what? For holding yeah. hands. All right, so the question is how much do I charge for, okay, I do charge, and here's my hourly rate, and it is going up, right? My hourly rate is $400 an hour, right? That's what I charge, that's my hourly rate. However, because you came here to this Bourbon Night of Learning, if you do schedule an appointment, I will give you a complimentary consultation, I'll look at what you bring in, I'll give you feedback on what I think you've got. Look, I've done this a lot, I've sold people before, why don't you just go back to that lawyer and just tell them this or that, right? That might be the answer. Or it may be that hey, it's time to update and here's what it'll cost you to do. All right? If you want to come in and talk to me, I'm more than happy. You can call the office. You got my card? Did they, do they yeah. have my card? Yeah. They got my card, you know how to reach us. Um, and you know, if you've got a lawyer already that you really like, like you know, for example, your son-in-law, um, <laughs> and, and you, you want to keep your son-in-law, and, and but and you don't want to hurt his feelings, but you're worried that maybe you know it's really not the right thing. I'll work with your son-in-law, and I'll help your son-in-law make sure your plan is done. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. One quick announcement, we would love to have you all come to our Purim Extravaganza. It's taking place Monday, March 9th. We start at 5.45-6 for the kids programming. There will be a kids Purim spiel, carnival games, bring the grandchildren. And then we also have adult entertainment after our Magilla reading. Be careful about talking about adult entertainment. I know, it's a, I'm sorry. We have Sean Blackman coming with audio words, an awesome like world jazz band. So we'd love to have you there.